Praise the Lord, saints. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Uh, as you can see, you know, I won't try to ignore the elephant in the room. We know what today is. Right? Uh, and to be quite honest with you, I'm like nervous as I'll get out. You know what I mean? Uh, you want to be uplifting in a time like this, you know. But you also want to be obedient as well, right? Like, I don't want to be, uh, I don't think it's downtrodden. But, um, you know, but do continue to remember Pastor David against, uh, I think he's, uh, you got to forgive his uh, thinking right now. He's a little clouded. He allowed me to step in and do this this morning. I really don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> Amen, but uh, no, nah, in all seriousness, he's got a lot on him this morning. It has been a rough weekend for me. He texted me and said, it's, it's going to be rough. Pray for me. And I believe he did all the mighty men. Yeah. You know, so, uh, just continue to remember him in prayer. And, uh, but I do have a message. He asked me last week if I would do it. And I said, sure. And he said, no, nah, I'm going to do it. You just save it for next week. I'm definitely going to need you next week. And I said, okay, no problem. And so this is. This has been on my mind for two weeks now, and uh, we'll see how it goes, right? <laughs> Amen. If you would, with me this morning, stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to turn and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I know we got a 
short amount of time between now and the other service, so I'll try not to be too long. But misunderstanding the blame. Let's, let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word this morning. Father, I just pray that the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth, Father, will be pleasing unto you, O God, this morning. And I pray that everything that's said and done will be to edify and lift up the body. Strengthen us, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would minister mildly in a special way to each and every individual here. And each and every, every one that they can minister to. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the glory and honor and praise. Show yourself strong this morning. Let your people see it. That we may further believe and depend upon you in all things. And give a testimony of what God has done in our lives. And in Christ Jesus' name, the church said... Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you're glad to see him this morning on the way down. <laughs> Misunderstanding the plan. Yeah, you know, I did a I did a jail ministry service one time, and we talked about the meaning of success. What it means to be successful. <clears throat> so I, I, and in that service I talked about the definition of success. I looked it up and I wrote it down. Old Webster has to help me from time to time. And it had two definitions. <coughs> I'm going to read it, read them to you this morning. It says, uh, definition number one is having achieved popularity, profit, or distinction. So the first definition of success is. A lot of people uh, take success, they take like uh, physical wealth, like finances, you know, popularity, movie stars, celebrities, athletes, have everything that the world has to offer, and they say, wow, you got success. Definition number two, the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. I like that one. And I believe that's along the lines of what, what God, God doesn't look at like uh, physical wealth like we do. He doesn't look at physical lifestyle like we do. We, we hold life as such a great prestige. We put it up on, on a platter, you know. We, we have a different outlook on what it is and what God does, you know. But it's not always the case, you know, physical success is not always the case of spiritual blessing, you know what I mean? Other than what a lot of TV preachers would like to tell you, that, you know, that, oh man, you, the closer you get to God, the easier life will be. <laughs> no, no, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. If anything, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that the Christian life is easier. I wouldn't say that it's harder, but as the Bible tells us, that the way of the transgressor is hard. The life of sin, you know, they have to deal with that conscience. They have to deal with that what's going on in your brain. What did Peter or Paul say? That the weapons of our warfare are what? They're not carnal. They're not physical, but they're spiritual. They're in the mind, and that's where we got to be this morning. We got to be. A spiritual mindset, and that's my goal today, is to just kind of <coughs> implement that this morning, to reiterate. It's going to be elementary. It's nothing, I don't come up here with great wisdom of knowledge. I'm only 36 years old. I don't have a whole lot of sense, I can tell you that. Because <laughs> I can also say that there's some facts in life, you know. And, and one of these facts is the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. Amen. <laughs> I don't I thought I knew it, but I don't know anything. Another fact is that there is God. God is there. Another fact is I ain't him. I stole that from Rudy. Anybody seen Rudy? Okay. <coughs> Matthew 6 and 19 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lay not up treasures on this earth. The treasures in heaven. See, we put so much importance on, on this life and what we need to achieve and what we need to go. And God says, I want you to achieve 
success. Purpose. Success. That aim. That goal. And how many believe that every person under the sound of my voice this morning and in that world has a purpose. Has a goal. Has an aim. God has designed you specifically for it. Peter you know, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It's my go-to for everything. You've probably heard me read it in a couple of old sermons from way back. It's supported. I just love Matthew chapter 16. It's probably my favorite passage. And that's a bold statement. Because there's a lot of awesome scripture in the Word of God. But I just love this one. It's like, it's my foundation. It's what I can go to in every sermon or in every, every downtime I can go there. Because it's an awesome thing. You know, this is where Peter misunderstands the plan of God. But you say, wait a minute, he just had an awesome revelation. He did. He hit, a, he hit a killer milestone in his life. Jesus sits down with his disciples and he says, who do men say that I am? And the most ridiculous answer I think that anyone could have said was, you're John the Baptist. Wait a minute. He grew up with John. John just got put, how can he be John if they lived at the same time? That makes no sense to me. But that's, that's the depths people are willing to go to not believe in the Christ. They'll come make up some fabrication story of anything that could be physically impossible to just deny what's actually what it is. The second thing is they say you're Elias or Jeremiah or one. They, they see the Spirit of God on them that was once in John the Baptist and then in the Scriptures of old, but they just don't want to come out and admit who he is. Then what does, what does Jesus ask him? He says, who do you, who do ye say that I am? Here's that milestone. Peter stands up and he's believing in his heart, confessing with his mouth, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood ain't revealed this unto thee. This is a spiritual revelation. This ain't nothing no man can teach you. This is God pulling on your hearts. He's revealing himself to you. Flesh and blood haven't revealed it unto you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. He says, There are Peter, stone." On that rock, that faith, I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates are a defensive mechanism, right? They keep things out. So that means you're going to be on the offense, Peter. You're going to be attacking. You're going to be moving forward. You're going to be doing great things for the kingdom of God. He says, upon that faith, every, and this is just not for Peter. This is for everybody either. You're to attack. We had this old saying back in wrestling high school. It was a famous uh, college, collegiate wrestler. His name was Lincoln McElroy. And he used to say, if you attack, not much bad can happen. It's the best defense you can have, ain't it? And that's what they say. The best, the best defense is an outstanding offense. I fully believe it. Um, gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth, whatever is bound in heaven will bound. Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. I've got this spiritual revelation. I'm spiritual. I'm part of God's plan. But the only problem was he had a different interpretation of what God's plan really was. See, for over 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they said Christ was coming to deliver the Israelite people, to, to get them out of bondage, to, to, to set them apart, to do the same. Peter's looking for a physical kingdom. Jesus is about to overthrow the Roman Empire. We're going to go up there. We're going to establish Israel as a sovereign nation. And guess who I'm going to be? I'm going to be his right hand man. I'm going to watch every miracle take place. I'm going to watch every healing. I'm going to watch this... This, this country go on forever. It's going to be great. I'm going to watch it all unfold by his right hand. Because he just said it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have it. And ain't that how God works in our lives though? He, he, he pulls us in and we have these great spiritual revelations and he says, alright, great. Now let me tell you the plan. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean I'm going to have to Wait, no, no, no. You mean it's not going to be like that? 
It's not going to be kingdoms. It's not going to be governmental buildings. It's not going to be fine clothes. It's not going to be a cakewalk. Wait a minute, God. This, this ain't part of the plan. No, no, Peter. And what does he say to Peter? He doesn't say, get thee behind me, Peter. What's he say to him? Our mind has a natural plan. We, we have this natural plan that we want to do. It can either be influenced by God or it can be influenced by Satan. He didn't say anything about Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're thinking of the things of this physical realm. What did he say? Lay not up treasures on this earth because guess what? The thief do break through and steal. The moth corrupts. So does rust. You know, it all breaks down over time. It has no value in the eyes of God. Are you saying my life doesn't have value? No, he says your life has value. But what does he also say? You'll find life when you put yours aside. That's the thought he was trying to get to Peter. He says when you put yours down, Peter, that's when you're going to find life. He said the thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it what? Right. See, I told you this was elementary. When we decide to put Brandon aside, see, I can't speak for you. I can speak for myself. I've been Peter on more than one occasion. You know, I've been Peter a lot of times. Wait a minute, God, that's, that's not my plan. Well, Brandon, you can go on with your plan. And let me tell you how it is. Nine times out of ten, it ends exactly the way he says it does. Moving right along. He valued his life. He valued his purpose. He valued his plan. But Jesus was trying to test him, was trying to open his eyes and reveal him. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, you're going to lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, the Old Testament and the New Testament aren't so different. But the plan did change. I think a lot of times Christians, you know, read the Old Testament and they think that that's exactly how it should be every time. There's a, there's, a, there's a problem. We can name any problem in there. Let's use uh, Gideon. Gideon's faced against many armies. Gideon is sought out by the angels. He's hiding actually from them. He says, what are you doing here, you mighty man of valor? He's actually hiding from them. And he calls him, the angel calls him a mighty man of valor. He says, God's called you to do it. And he took 300 men. He stepped out on faith. And defeated the army with insurmountable odds. Joshua and Caleb. They wanted to take the land. They wanted to do great things. Uh, had to wait till Joshua became leader and led them into the promised land. They stand up against the undefeated city. The city that could not be beat. Jericho. Put their life on the line. They put their life on the line. Trusted God, God brought forth the victory. Daniel wouldn't stop praying, refused to stop, put his life on the line, God delivered. David stepped out on the battlefield against unsurmountable odds, against a man of war, against someone who was trained in combat time and time again. Put his life on the line. Unsurmountable laws, God delivered. What do you say in all this stuff, brother? Listen to the one thing that's in common in all of them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Refused to bow at that altar or that idol. He said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter, O king. 
know this, God is able to deliver us. But if he don't, we're not going to bow. Put their life on the line, and we all know how the story ends. Put their life on the line. You know, sometimes things don't go according to plan, you know, in this life. You know, the Old Testament, whenever men put their life on the line, God brought forth and brought the victory. See, what's changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament is Christ put his life on the line. And he's already won the victory. We look at every small detail in our lives and we say, well, God, we're losing here, we're losing there. You know, and I, I've done it numerous times. You know, I, I'll go ahead and say it. I don't understand I don't understand why Brother David, or other saints for that matter, endure so much when they put their life on the line. But then God checks me and he says, Brandon, I've already won the victory. It's already won. It's done. He says, I want to know. I want to know and I want to see. I put, Brother Keith said it right two Sundays ago. He said, God sets it up to where he already knows the outcome, so he puts pawns and pieces in place for the victory ahead. He says, he knew where Bethany needed to be, and he knew David could handle it. I mean, that that's, that's spiritual right there from heaven. And man, that impacted me so much. Thank you, brother, for being a beat. You know, it's just, that opened my mind to a lot of different possibilities. You know, you know, you're exactly right. I don't understand why there's some battles we lose, but God says, I've already, I've already won the victory. That doesn't refrain from us having to put our life on the line day in and day out. I was talking to a friend of mine one time. His name is uh, Josh Edwards. Uh, we played, um, I played in this baseball league about three summers ago. It was, it was a while back. But we were sitting there talking. We were talking about, I think there was on TV a big UFC fight or something. They're talking about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He said he wanted to learn one time. Or he, he did learn, I guess. And, uh, he said and he had an acquaintance, a friend of his. I don't remember how the story goes exactly, but he was telling me about how the friend agreed to train him in it. Said, yeah, I'll train him. Come on out to the dojo or whatever it is they do. So he said, Brandon, I got there and I met with him and he said, Brandon, they wore me. He said, they put me against every experienced opponent they had. They stretched me. They beat me. He said, I could barely walk when I got home. He said, but when I left that night, he said, our, our next meet, or our next uh, practice, I don't know what they call it. He said, is that this day, such and such a time? He said, okay. And he showed up, and he walks to the door, and he says, oh, I'm here. And he says, I'm good. He said, man, y'all worked me over, man. He said, y'all beat me to death. He said, I'm so sore, I can hardly walk. He said, you know why I did that, don't you? I don't know why. They're playing. He said, if I put you through that much excruciating pain, and that hurt, and that grind, and you come back, you wanted to be here. You truly wanted it. I knew a baseball coach that would do the same thing. He would put... Tryouts would start and he would make baseball players do ridiculous things over and over again for weeks straight, weeks straight. Stuff that had nothing to do with baseball. Go out there and hop on one leg from here to the first base. You know, they make them do ridiculous stuff. Because after a week of that, they were still there. They really wanted to play. So many people, man, we just say, all right, God, I just confess and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll just jump on easy street now. And God says, no, I really want you. Saying that's what God does. I, I, I told you I don't have wisdom. I don't. But what did He say in Matthew twenty-five? He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. God wants us to sell ourselves a hundred percent. And brother, if you think that I'm preaching to you, you are dead wrong. I'm preaching to Brother Brandon this morning. Believe me, this message is echoed through my mind over and over again. Brandon, you got to sell your stuff. You've got to give it all. 
You've got to give everything you got because if you want any taste of life. But God, what about these victories that I'm not receiving? Look, look, brother. Everything in this life is circumstantial. You're right. God can snap his fingers. He can give us everything we want. But it's just like that young and of yours. If you give him everything you want, are you doing him any good? <coughs> Sometimes you got to say no. Sometimes you got to, because you, you as the adult, you as the parent, know what's best for your children, right? God's saying, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father and some of them could. You think that it's not without a price? You think God's going to ignore it? He said, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him freely give us all things? He said, God, I see the pain. I see the punishment. I see everything that you endure in your life for my name's sake, and you think it's going to go unrewarded? I was talking to D.C. And up here a couple weeks ago, and he was, he was venting out a few things about Bethany, you know, about I said, brother, you don't understand. He was frustrated. I said, you don't understand. You're right. I can sit here and tell you flat-footed that her whole life was unfair. From the day she was popped out of the womb, everything she endured, it was unfair. But let me tell you something, brother. God said those that are first are going to be last. And those that are last in this life. So if I work out at Terry Point, there's those guys that got them classified badges. <laughs> they classified. I can't even go where they can go, Jack. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let me see it. And Bethany definitely has places that she's going to have a seat at the table that we can't even get up to. <laughs> see, it's not unrewarded. It's not neglected. You think that God may be ignoring you in your times of trouble. You think God that may be not paying attention to your life. Let me tell you something to that. God sees every fine, minute detail that you've endured. And I know that, brother, I ain't endured nothing compared to some of you saints in here today. I know I have. But let me tell you something. God has not ignored. He hasn't. He has not ignored your pain. He says those that endure to the end Endure. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fair. It's not going to be right. But God says, I hold something more accountable in eternity than I do on this physical realm. Everything here is just temporary. God's already got the victory, saints. Lay not up treasures. Lay up your treasures in that home above, trusting, fully trusting in the Savior's will. Doing what I can for heaven's holy. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Amen. That's all I have this morning, saints. If Brother BJ can come play us something right quick, we'll close out my word of prayer. Um, thank you, everybody. I know it wasn't very lengthy. I told you I wouldn't keep you long. I hope something was said, a word of encouragement. Um, please come back today at 1 o'clock. Be here for your pastor and the pastor's family. If you can, let's all stand this morning. If you want to make a place at the altar, you're welcome to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Help us to be successful, God. Not on our merit, but on yours. Help us to fulfill that purpose you have in our life. You know what it is. God, I pray that you would strengthen each and every one here. You see the struggles, you see the heartaches. Let them know that it's not in vain, God. That it's not unrewarded. Father, that you hold them in high regard.
everything that they feel hurt here is going to be ten times over on the other side. Help us to remain faithful, Lord God, to the victory. Faithful to the victory, Lord God. Father, I just pray that you would touch each and every life, each and every situation, each and every need this morning. Brother Steve, would you close us out in the morning?